So today we want to um, dig in, and we have a gr- lot of ground to cover. We're going to talk about evil and sin and the law and about Christ. So we're going to be all over the place, but that's what you do in an overview course, and we just keep on cranking along. Keep in mind what we're covering in this course is essentially um, everything you're going to do in systematics after you've done it in this course. You know, with Lewis in mind, in Confessions 1 and 2, and Systems 1, 2, 3, everything is going to be revisited again. So you know, the goal here is to give a, an entrance the use of some of the vocabulary and um, you know some of the basic ideas. We don't have to have everything settled just yet. It'll come along as you make your way through the through the program, I'm sure. Um, sometimes, you know, this, this, we think about theology and you know, you're trying to get all the pieces put together, like you know, like strings and a pearl. And I try to give you that analogy of the body yesterday. I think that's a better way to think about it. So I try to think about it as a whole and see how the whole thing fits together because it does. It's difficult to teach it because you can't give the whole thing all at once. You've got to go pieces at a time. But hopefully by the time it's done, you start seeing how the whole thing kind of coheres together, and it is one big thing. Um, an adult instruction class, I, tell, you know, I used to tell students in that kind of a situation that what we're doing in this class is sort of skating over the pond of Lutheran theology, over Christian theology, and we're going about three inches deep all the way across it. And, and you could pick any point anywhere along the way and drop down and just go, go down, 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 down into the depths of what's down there. And that's the same thing here. So we're kind of skating over the whole Lutheran theology and going maybe a couple of feet deep. And that's about it. So in other words, there's a whole lot more underneath any of one of these things that we could talk about. And <coughs> so don't think, oh, it's just going to be rehash for the rest of my three years here. It won't be, I hope. You're going to be going further and develop, delving into new things, side issues, and going a lot deeper. <coughs> you can pick any given topic we, I mentioned here and you could probably spend the rest of your life researching it and digging into it. It's just the nature of it. That's the way it is. So don't feel like you've got the command of everything once you've you know, made it through this and read the book or something. It's, there's a lot more involved in it. And the more you learn, the more you realize what you don't know, which is typical in most fields, I suppose. Yesterday, you said something <coughs> about um, thinking about the way in which we want to be shaped. Yeah. What if you haven't got a clue? Well, then you trust those who are um, trying to shape you, and you figure out who you should trust. That's probably my advice more than anything. Make sure you, you trust those who are doing it and that you respect them and feel like they're worthy of your trust of them. Because it's going to happen. That's the plan. And that's not to say, oh, no, there's, you better be careful. I mean, I think the, the, the people around here who are trying to do the job are trustworthy. But just be aware of this happening. Know it make choices. But quite frankly, you will go into classrooms and every, every guy who is in the classroom has things that are important to him, his agenda, if you will. And sometimes the agenda with one guy might not agree exactly with another guy. That's going to happen. And that's always the, one of the delights of students, you know, competing profs kind of thing. You know, oh, I heard this in another class. And, you know, and we always immediately backpedal and say, well, you know, and <laughs> we all mean the same thing, really. But, you know, there are, there are differences and different emphases, no doubt. It's part of what makes it fun. Okay? All right. So today we want to discuss the problem of evil. And that's where we're going to start. And that's our first discussion this morning. The problem of evil. <coughs> it's been set up this way. This is kind of the classic situation. We have three premises. First premise is that God is good. Uh, and then the, wow, well, let's talk about that. We okay with that? Everybody agree with that? That's good? Any argument? All right, good. Glad for that. Pretty scriptural. We're okay with that. God is good. Well, it's a song, right? God is good. What's that? He is so good to me. Yeah, uh, there's all kinds of them, so it must be right. If it's in a song, it's got to be right. Uh-huh. Lex orandi, lex credendi, right? law of praying, law of worship is the law of believing. So God is good. Second premise, God is all-powerful. Okay? Or omnipotent, if you prefer the Latin. And at this stage in your career, of course you do, because you're trying to look like you know what you're talking about. So go for the Latin. So God is omnipotent. God is all-powerful. We okay with that one? What makes God God, right? Do anything in control of all things. Third premise is evil 
exists. We agree with that? Yeah, okay. All right. So, add them up. Everything fit? Not very well. No, it doesn't all fit. And this is where we run into the problem. This has been a problem, actually, since way back. You know, the Greek philosophers first brought up the criticism, and it's been repeated again and again and again. Hume brought it up. Lessing tried to deal with it. All kinds of philosophers have dealt with it and addressed this issue. But we have these three premises. God is good. God is all-powerful. And evil exists. And it doesn't seem to add up. And the philosophers used to say, well, if God is so good and he's all-powerful, then why doesn't he do something about the evil that is out there? Or maybe the fact is he's really not so all-powerful. Or maybe he's really not so good. Something's not adding up here. Because if you have this God who is so loving and caring and really wants to help us out and really is concerned for his flock and all the kind of stuff you hear in sermons all the time, God who really cares that way, and you have a God who is almighty and all-powerful, the creator of everything, he's in control of everything, he's the run, one calling every shot, he's in control, then why in the world do people suffer? And why in the world do God's people suffer? And the question hasn't stopped just because we're living now in the 21st century. In fact, it gets asked frequently. And it gets asked usually at the most unfortunate, uncomfortable times, like at the bedside of a young child dying of cancer, or at the funeral of a family who's been killed tragically in a car accident. And everybody wants to know, hey, God's good. God's all-powerful. How did this happen? Now, this, I would argue, probably poses the single greatest threat, the greatest challenge to the Christian, our whole Christian setup and how we look at things. It really does. This, this is a really a serious challenge to us and how we understand God and his working and how we come to terms with this. And if you really want to um, throw Christians into a tailspin, you just go after this one. This is probably the best attack you've got if you're going to really try to bring Christianity down or make it look ridiculous. It seems like on these premises there's another one that most people are always coming up with and it's that God is uh, omnipresent everywhere. Okay. Yeah. And, and that's all powerful. You could, you could almost make an argument if you didn't believe in the omnipresent thing that he just wasn't paying attention or he wasn't there. Oh, that he wasn't tuned in. Yeah, okay, but when, it, when if you accept the premise that he's everywhere, then it becomes really hard to, 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 to deal with the question about why do people suffer. Yeah, right, right. Well, if he's really good and he's really all-powerful, yeah, then the omnipresence kind of comes in here. Because if you say, well, maybe he just missed that one. <laughs> what kind of almighty God is that? You know, he pretty much disqualifies himself. So I think you're right. I think the omnis omnipresence probably rules into the omnipotence here just for the sake of the simplicity. But you're right. That's, that's a key part of it. And what you're, what you're getting at is how the, the attempt to try to answer this question. So uh, Well, in the inference that he's standing right there. Yeah, I'm well, he's, he's there and he's aware of it. Look, this was the question that was asked all the time um, a few years ago in the wake of the 9 11, September 11th tax. Where was God? God. And people wanted to know. And pastors ran into their pulpits and gave answers. And that's what we're going to talk about now. The kind of answers that were given and how legitimate they are, what the right answers are, and how we sort this thing out. So, let's try to address this thing. The, the whole premise of trying to deal with this, like I said, this goes, the Greeks first brought this thing up. I first brought this attack and it has been repeated again and again and again usually by people who are antagonistic to Christianity. And they figured that this one, it got you by the, by the throat. And it got you. And you're in trouble. And so there have been many Christians who have said, what we've got to try to do is come to terms with this thing. And traditionally, ever since a guy named Lessing, who coined the term, we have called this attempt to try to work this thing out doing a theodicy. A theodicy. Okay? And if you do your quasi-anatomical you know, um, 
picking it apart and looking at the um, etymology of the thing. You see in there, Thaos again, which means God. And then you also see in here, Diki or Diko, Dikao, or the judge, justify. You know, Dikao, righteousness. And so a theodicy means to justify God. That's what it means. So to do a theodicy means you're trying to justify or vindicate God. You're trying to um, save God from a mess. You're trying to clean things up for him. Because you're realizing that the situation doesn't look very good for God. Because if God is good and God is all-powerful, then evil should not exist. And so they are, you make attempts to try to, to fix this and try to deal with it. Now, if you're going to try to do this rationally or logically, you've got three premises, and so basically you only have three points of attack to try to deal with this thing. And so the very first, the most popular way of dealing with this is probably to go after number two.